gentlemen friends and colleagues a very very warm welcome uh delighted with this opportunity uh, to engage with you on behalf of the telecap at this 13th uh, sankal global summit uh it's, it's a virtual summit for us uh, as as we all know and uh, we're delighted that you could make time today to be part of this uh, this very esteemed panel that i'm very very humbled to be to be moderating i think on on this whole uh, topic of exploring private sector finance for forestry in india <clears throat> uh we would be really focusing on uh, trees outside forest and and the village commons and not so much on the designated forest areas uh as as most of you are aware uh, india is you know as per the policy proclamation does need about 33% of the geographical area under tree and forest cover uh we are currently at somewhere around 25% i need not really elaborate in terms of why uh, trees uh, are important uh, for their ecological economical and uh, social uh, uh, requirements that we have uh, as a society as businesses as as uh, uh, you know the security that it does provides to us i think that the context uh, that this topic becomes quite important is is more from a perspective of you know two two clear directions one uh, globally and one more from uh, uh, you know india's commitment and the ndc uh, globally we do know i think this decade is the decade of uh, ecological restoration uh, there is a huge amount of interest uh, globally in terms of really looking at land restoration uh ecological restoration at, at a massive scale between 21 and 30, uh, 2030 uh, but more importantly for us uh, i believe it is the the commitments that we have as part of the uh, climate change convention the ndcs that uh, the forestry sector would really look at an incremental sequestration of about 2.5 to 3 billion tons uh, by 2030 now that's that's a, that's an onerous task even if we kind of leave that aside uh, those of us who have been working in the field of forestry working with the communities and ensuring uh, landscape restoration or, or watershed management we do know how critical it is and in particularly for the rainfed areas that uh, the tree cover is an ecological balance that needs to be really restored for you know not only for the the quality of life but also for production system that all the rural india is really dependent on which is which is agriculture i think as part of coming back to ndc we we all know looking at the the sector and understanding the sector that this uh, vision this this kind of mission that's been set out uh, by the honorable prime minister really saying that we would look at an incremental 2.5 to 3 billion tons of carbon equivalent uh, through sequestration over the next uh, uh, nine years or less uh, yeah it is it is a big hairy goal uh, that's that's been been set out i i do believe uh, personally that yes it is it is a feasible uh, goal to go after it is uh, it is stuff it is looking at the commitments that we have that we do need to really uh, chase that goal and i'm sure that we would be able to 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 achieve that but of course you know when i when i do say uh, uh feasible uh i'm the the challenges are are quite uh, numerous and i would really say you know to to my uh, experience and knowledge there are i can bucket them into five broad challenges i think first and foremost is is, is around land <clears throat> if we do really need to look, look at trees outside forest while on paper looking at the data that's available we can really say that the land is available but do we have land which has recognized seigneurial rights uh on 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 private lands and and can we secure that is that is that you know a challenge that we would need to address as we go along uh on second you know my bucket is is around technology our uh, we, we all know our productive productivity levels are are pretty low uh, compared to the averages around the world uh, and uh, you know the question is do we have the requisite technology that can quickly be scaled up the third third is around around institutions you know a mission like this really cannot be achieved by individual action 
we do need to really bring in uh, institutions, whether it is community, whether it is uh, you know cooperatives, whichever shape and form that these institutions do do, do take. Uh, do we have these institutions ready to really look at and, and, and work within the ecosystem to deliver this this very ambitious goal that's been been set out? We we know from a policy and the legislation perspective, uh, there have been perceptional differences in how people view forest or the definition of forest. But just last week, uh, I've seen this uh, draft amendments to the Forest Conservation Act uh, that have been put out by Government of India for, for consultation. And as part of the consultation paper, in you know, a background paper that's, that's been attached, one does really look at in terms of easing out in terms of the clarifications on what would constitute forest that would attract the, the uh, you know, the statute and the, the Forest Conservation Act. Some of the private areas, some of the institutional lands, prior to a cutoff date that's been suggested, uh, this particular amendment proposes at this point in time that it would uh, not be constituted or, or construed as, as forest. Is that enough? Uh, uh, you know this this proposed amendment is that enough for uh, what what we really need to look at? Because we do all know that apart from the Forest Conservation Act, it's also the Indian Forestry Act that uh, that governs uh, uh, some of the, the the aspects that we need to be that need to be streamlined. Last and not the least uh, is is of course the finance that uh, uh, we we do need to really bring in to this incremental uh, sequestration that we are really looking at. There's a report by the Department of Expenditure, a subcommittee on finance that was set up by Government of India, to really look at what have been these commitments that Government of India has made, where is the money going to come from? And both they do look at uh, energy and forestry sector. And uh, I think if my uh, data is correct, uh, we are looking at close to about four to six billion dollars of investments in every year in the forestry sector to be achieving that goal. <clears throat> Even with that goal, this particular report does go on to say that it will take us <clears throat> to 2038 rather than 2030 to be to be reaching out to that goal. So you know that's that's again one of the the uh, imperatives that we do need to look at. I think this uh, level of investment uh, would really need to be talking about bringing in private capital to leverage on the public and development finance that is already being uh, being invested and and you know that's where this particular session that we are specifically uh, we would really be talking about uh, the this this aspect but the other four as well do impinge on uh, you know the absolutely critical requirement to my mind on how best we are able to to leverage uh, and, and achieve the mission kind of going forward. So these are, you know, some of the the opening uh, questions that you know this this very esteemed panel uh, will try and address. Uh, you know, these three eminent panelists that that have uh, kindly agreed to spare time and share their knowledge and experience with us. Uh, they bring in uh, individually and collectively decades of experience uh, in designing delivery. Uh, and critiquing the models that that we have currently in the country. You know, at, at this point, I'm I'm delighted to to introduce uh, Mr. Shiva Kumar, uh, Group Head at ITC uh, for Agri and IT Businesses. Uh, Shivji is someone I have followed over the last 15 years uh, in terms of her work and thought leadership, and I'm I'm delighted sir, that you could really uh, make time uh, today uh, to to. Be part of this uh, this panel. Uh, we have uh, uh, Mr. Paul, global lead on environment at the World Bank, uh, based uh, based out of uh, the National Capital Region. Currently, he's speaking to us from Noida. Uh, is currently leads, uh, <coughs> excuse me, a senior team looking at issues of uh, forest and livelihood security uh, at the World Bank. And I'm as eager as everyone here to hear your views, Tapas, on how best we can build on an enabling ecosystem for promoting trees outside forest and forestry sector in, in, in general. Uh, we are also joined uh, by Dr. Rohini Chaturvedi, 
uh, she's an eminent researcher nationally and internationally, a personal friend and a sector colleague. Uh, we do share our uh, grounding in the forestry sector at the Indian Institute of Forest Management. Ms. Rohini went on to do her master's and then eventually her PhD from University of Cambridge. Uh, she's worked, worked a lot around the issues of landscape restoration uh, at, at various uh, positions that she has held. Uh, thanks, Rohini, for accepting my, my invitation. Um, I'm, I'm delighted that you could be part of this. Uh, Rohini joins us from, from Pune. Uh, at this point, just to uh, let everybody know, uh, we as a panel will try and really look at this uh, conversation, uh, which would initially be uh, one-sided. Uh, we would you know, share our experiences with you. Each of the panelists would have 12 to 15 minutes uh, as part of the opening remarks. We would then open it up for discussion uh, amongst uh, uh, the four of us. The last 20 minutes, we would really uh, like to, to engage with you. Uh, you know, we're most grateful that you could uh, uh, take time and join this, join this discussion. Keep your questions coming. Uh, two of my colleagues would be curating those questions, clubbing them together, and uh, we would then put it across to the panel. We would leave last five minutes uh, for closing remarks uh, by uh, by the all the panelists put together, um, and that's that's the plan for for this next uh, uh, 35 18 minutes that we have. So, uh, without uh, you know, further ado, uh, may I request Shivji to to come in and uh, share with with us uh, specifically in terms of your experience, like you see the experience on leading uh, a very strong. Uh, uh, movement, uh, you know, a scalable model that, that that's come about over the last uh, 20, 25 years. Over to you, Shifty. Thank you, JSG. I think uh, it's a very opportune moment. Uh, a subject like this is uh, always opportune because uh, we are several decades too late in dealing with uh, the forestry. And uh, some of the challenges that you outlined, uh, I completely echo. You know, to meet the NDCs uh, of India, uh, we need to bring in the private sector uh, in to supplement what government could do. And how does one go about uh, is uh, certainly a, an ongoing uh, issue that we must deliberate and uh, make that happen. Firstly, uh, to, to kind of look at the fundamentals of private sector finance, the last challenge that you talked about, it is uh, important that the value creation and value capture must be facilitated. Uh, without that, uh, it is difficult to get the private sector uh, finances in and uh, where are those value creation opportunities and what's the headroom that we have? Uh, I'll touch upon that in the first instance uh, and then expand that uh, a bit to talk about what ITC has done uh, over the last uh, few years in uh, doing uh, the uh, sustainable forestry work on scale uh, so far. And then uh, briefly touch upon the land aspect and uh, whether we just focus on trees outside forest and uh, what scope we have within forest uh, and then uh, leave it at that. Uh, so that's what I will uh, cover. Uh, like I mentioned, the value creation opportunity uh, is the starting point and there are two kinds of values. One is the typical business financial value in terms of how you link up the forest produce into the various value chains of uh, these companies, whether it is uh, uh, the wood-based uh, industries or potentially other uh, produce like uh, herbs and uh, uh, other kind of medicinal plants, and uh, even at an orchard level, fruits. And of course, when you broaden, like you mentioned, possibly agroforestry, there are potentially many value chains that can get integrated. I think what differentiates in the context of 
uh, NDC is also that uh, the value chains are not just the conventional value chains of backward integration by any of these companies, but uh, they must also be green in terms of uh, what kind of uh, carbon sequestration is really happening there, uh, as also inclusive in the sense that what we are dealing with from the perspective of and livelihoods. I mean, I'll touch upon that bit in a, in a little while. And uh, uh, the second kind of value is uh, to try and uh, uh, meet the, uh, the net zero commitments that many other corporates have and the role that uh, forests can play in uh, making it happen. Uh, so that's uh, uh, another kind of uh, value that uh, can also bring in uh, the finances. So in terms of the first piece, there is a plenty of headroom. Uh, today, uh, as you know, uh, nearly a quarter of our consumption of wood, if I just focus on wood in the first instance out of the various value chains I mentioned, a quarter of all our consumption annually we import, uh, spending as much as uh, $7-$8 billion worth of uh, foreign exchange uh, every year. Uh, and uh, productivity aspect you already mentioned, uh, we are just about 0.4 tons uh, cubic meters per hectare as opposed to 2.1 globally. So there is headroom both from the perspective of demand as also from the perspective of productivity that can uh, match uh, that kind of demand. And uh, uh, this is what one can make use of uh, to be able to create uh, value chains uh, that could bring in finances from the uh, private sector. And, and same thing goes for whether it is fruits and those kind of things, and I'll uh, touch upon them uh, as I talk. The uh, opportunity to actually make this happen in trees outside forest, uh, not only now as just a prospect, but as something which uh, we have done uh, over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, for our uh, paperboard business, uh, we have similar example in our uh, bamboo-based uh, business and uh, poplar-based business also. But just now for paperboard, uh, I can uh, say that nearly a million acres of uh, land uh, belonging to the various uh, private wasteland, private uh, tribal lands, uh, which have been brought into uh, the afforestation as a sustainable source of feeding in our paperboard uh, uh, business. But in order to make this happen, uh, one first needs to look at uh, what is the uh, opportunity that exists for the growers in terms of their income levels, uh, as also the proximity to the unit so that the economic viability uh, improves. And uh, more importantly, the technology element that you briefly touched upon, that uh, if one were growing any of these uh, species uh, closer to uh, your unit, uh, how do you get uh, those uh, uh, clones and uh, varieties that are uh, good productivity, or lower water consumption, any of these kind of parameters, or higher pulp yield and all of that in the available soil and agroclimatic conditions? And, and therefore, a fair amount of uh, investment went into R&D to step up uh, the technology. Uh, and also, uh, equal amount of effort in terms of silviculture practices being brought to the, uh, the growers in such a manner that some of the good uh, practices are actually adopted at the uh, farm level uh, to be able to uh, uh, scale up the productivity and tend to their uh, trees. Uh, where, of course, there are uh, uh, lands belonging to absentee farmers, uh, approaches like block plantation makes much better sense. And where there are smaller growers, in order to keep their cash flows in, uh, the agroforestry uh, model made sense, which again meant some amount of technology uh, to refine uh, the right agronomic practices in terms of what should be the uh, the row uh, distances and how should the geometry of the plot be in a manner that your resources from the land and water are appropriately used up for the uh, food crops as well as for the trees, as also what happens to the shades 
uh, of the trees in, in the way they'll impact uh, the food crops that are being grown and, and therefore the, uh, the agroforestry uh, element there. And uh, uh, because you are engaged in uh, a very large number of growers and uh, creating finances for them in the first instance to be able to get uh, until the trees actually uh, pay back uh, uh, besides the uh, uh, locations where agroforestry is also formed. Uh, there is an induction of finance that is uh, very much necessary. Uh, interesting models uh, were used by us in terms of the uh, cooperatives or the farmers or sanghas to which uh, ITC then lent uh, as a seed money, which the growers used and as their uh, tree started uh, delivering cash back in four to five years time. Uh, they uh, paid back, uh, but not paying back to ITC, but paying back to a, a village development uh, uh, fund so that uh, the ongoing uh, cycle continues that uh, newer farmers are brought in uh, and then uh, they get onto this kind of a cycle and models of that kind. Uh, and then of course, uh, opportunity from uh, carbon credits when the market was thriving a little better earlier, uh, that was possible and uh, forest stewardship council certification to bring some of those benefits back. So all of these were also value opportunities for the uh, growers. Uh, so I think it is uh, uh, social mobilization, community engagement is as much important in making these things possible, especially when you're looking at uh, outside forests. Uh, as is uh, technology uh, in uh, making this uh, happen. And uh, the fact that uh, it is uh, over this period at a scale of a million acres uh, suggests that uh, uh, scale is also uh, possible here uh, as similar value chains integration is done uh, and uh, uh, the carbon sequestration that happened uh, made us actually uh, four multiples of our own uh, emissions as carbon positive. So that is uh, one dimension of the work. And talking about this net zero angle and the value capture possible from there, uh, interestingly, uh, just to quote an example, not only just from our uh, forest uh, linked businesses, but in uh, our own commitment uh, on the water positive and net zero on water, uh, in addition to the work that is done on watershed and the demand management and water and all that. An important effort was in development of forests in the fringe areas to ensure that your water retention is done well and your uh, soil runoffs are also well protected and all of that. So therefore there is, the well, scale is not obviously as large as it is for forest linked businesses, but that is also a, uh, a sizable uh, kind of activity. And uh, uh, just to touch upon the land issue, uh, if, if we are talking about uh, as much as 26 million hectares to meet our commitments of uh, nearly 3 billion tons of COT equivalent, uh, I think uh, there's not enough uh, trees outside forest that we can bring in uh, into uh, this kind of a model, even if it is agroforest. And agroforestry, of course, in addition to the farmer's cash cycle, also benefits uh, in, in the whole uh, debate on food versus fiber. Uh, equation. Uh, but uh, there is an opportunity in the forest lands itself. Uh, uh, there is, a, if you keep the dense forest aside, whether it is very dense or moderately dense, you still have open forests uh, as much as uh, 30 million hectares. You still have shrubs uh, as much as 4 plus million hectares, nearly 35 million hectares of uh, stressed forest, degraded forests. Uh, another million odd hectares of underproductive forest lands which are there. And uh, it is possible uh, to using technology and many of the uh, models of linking to the value chains that I talked about in the private uh, wastelands, uh, also related to forest to step up. And so as much as uh, uh, the point you made on bringing private sector finance to uh, deliver NDCs, it is also equally critical to bring in the uh, lands under forests and scale up uh, those canopies. Because in any case, open is just under 40% canopy and shrubs even less than 10% canopy. There's potential upside uh, which exists there from the available land. Uh, so that's also something that 
uh, one must look at. So I think headroom is there, opportunity is there. Uh, it, it is creatively making use of uh, the partnerships and uh, making these inclusive that one can create uh, the value for multiple stakeholders. Uh, so that's where I leave my opening remarks at. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, as always, uh, absolutely articulate and to the point uh, delighted. Uh, Tapis, uh, uh, can you come in next and really look at from your perspective and the role uh, that you play as part of the World Bank team? Uh, how do you how do you see uh, this whole prospect of uh, you know private sector uh, playing a role in in the Indian policy sector? Thank you, Jayesh. Um, thank you, uh, Shikumarji, for uh, telling us about your experience and your, your ideas about what can be done. Uh, surely, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, speak, in, uh, speak on behalf of the private sector. Uh, ITC and the other private sector leaders should know much more than what I know about the investment uh, opportunities and the challenges. Uh, I could talk about uh, the World Bank's uh, involvement in sustainable forest management. And when I say sustainable forest management, it's uh, forest management inside and outside the designated forest areas or protected areas. And uh, surely I take pride uh, as part of the World Bank Group, which is the largest financier of sustainable forest management in the world. Uh, we have financed in the last 10, 15 years, anything between 1.5 to $4 billion per year for sustainable forest management. So yeah, in one sense, we can take pride, but the pride is punctured when we, look, when we have the perspective. Uh, the estimate of investment required for the world to sustainably manage the forest is somewhere between $70 billion per year is the least estimate, and $160 billion per year. And not more than 1%, 2% of that is coming as development assistance from all the multilateral, including World Bank. And maybe the governments are together putting another 5%. Uh, we don't have the full uh, uh, data, so I cannot say maybe 5, maybe a little more than 5, et cetera, et cetera. So, but what is being invested in sustainable forest management is not more than say six, seven percent of what is required. And the question, like in the case of uh, rangeland management in Pakistan or uh, our forest management in Bhin Gwalior area, that if we need to spend two lakh rupees per hectare and if you end up spending 10,000 rupees per year, Basically, it's better not to spend, not to spend that money. And uh, because we keep on saying that we are spending 25,000 rupees per hectare in Bhin Morena. And when we know that, I mean, you need to spend at least 2 lakh rupees to give any chance of the forest to generate there. So the question is that this 6, 7% may not mean a lot. So the question then, the, therefore, the question is the remaining part has to be financed. And right now, I don't see that other than private sector, uh, how this can be solved. So it is very important for at a global level for sustainable forest management, including protection of the high value forests. It is very important that private sector investment comes in. Now, of course, there, there has been a lot of discussion about it for a long, long time. Uh, World Bank has produced some analytics uh, starting from 2003. Uh, until the last analytics, which was published in 2020, is about how, how to get pension funds to finance forestry operations. Now, uh, and there is, uh, there, is, uh, uh, there is lots of lessons that we learn from private sector investment. Again, private sector investment today is not too big globally. Um, probably, probably about $3 billion per year. In 2011, the last year where we have authentic data, it was $1.7 billion in 2011. 
and out of the 1.7 billion dollars private finance which went into forestry most of it went to latin america and that too in brazil uh, asia uh, pacific had probably 15 16% uh, of that private finance into forestry maybe it has improved a little by in last 10 years but in 2011 it was like 289 million dollars and that all went into plantation forestry so plantation so all of this is about plantation so so the experience from private sector investment when we talk about what worked what didn't work what are the challenges uh, the experience is mostly from plantation end of work and of course there are uh, noticeable honorable exceptions including in our country fortunately uh, but uh, 90% of that investment is still on plantation and i would think that plantation is not necessarily equivalent to full scale forestry or sustainable forestry management so our reflections on and experience and lessons are somewhat limited by what has been the past investment and if we look at uh, those experience then the questions are that there are perceived risks whether uh, there are actual risk uh, and uh, whether this is actual risk is any different from perceived risk uh, maybe maybe it varies from place to place but perceived risk for private sector investment is so high that we lose sight of whether there are actual risks or not so that's one thing and this perceived risks are about what uh, again uh, most of these perceived risks are about land tenure because private investors are not really sure about the tenure that they get to manage the forest and we can come back to indian situation for example i mean ministry has talked about it ministry of forest and others have talked about it is that when we give um, land for say mining use this is 60 years tenure but people don't think about whether in 60 years i will retain the land as fellow and unused or abused and should i use the 60 years to make some forest there because i am not going to use the entire 60 Uh, entire land in the uh, first year or so because the mining mining progresses uh, either the active mining or the uh, closing closure of the mining progresses year by year so we have not spent time on that but generally people will be worried about private sector is worried about uh, tenure and related to that is the risk of uh, risk of finance and financing terms because if your tenure is 10 15 years and not 32 years or not perpetual means then it is very difficult to get somebody finance you because short term land tenure uh, does not give you the guarantee so that uh, you can get uh, finance at a favorable term so that is across the globe so it may not be uh, such a problem and the third issue is about upfront cost everywhere it is seen that Uh, compared to other investments which private sector can put their money in if they want to put their money into forestry the upfront cost capital cost is too high compared to many other situations so these are the perceived risks in addition to what we normally talk about whether you agree with the people whether there are forest dependent people whether there are forest fringe people and whether the forest dwelling communities and how you are working with them so apart from all of those things which are actual actual issues other than that this perceived risks are uh, too high so we need to actually address when we think about india and how to attract more investment in uh, forests even if trees outside forest we need to actually spend a lot of time managing this perceived risks and whether we can do that our risk management lessons are related to providing information inventory for example in most cases asia even in brazil the inventory is not very clear even in india now that we are talking about private sector investment in outside forest the question will again come that how do we differentiate between what is coming from outside the forest and what is coming from inside the forest so that we don't go back to the pre 96 situation again where 
because there is no guarantee that I mean, you are not destroying forestry, uh, uh, real forest and high value forest uh, by doing trees outside forest. Uh, so we need to have that uh, information, transparent information, information in the open and uh, inventory information and plus certification that nothing is coming out uh, from inside the forest or at least the area of forest that we are interested to preserve. Uh, so from the government side, I would think, or public uh, regulator side, I think it's very, very important that the data should be fully available. In India, you know, I mean, I'm, as a citizen, I know that forest data is not necessarily very clear. I mean, normally I don't get to understand, even if I'm from a hill state, so I really don't have a clear idea about where the forest boundary is. So that depends on interpretation. Uh, survey maps don't uh, show what is the forest boundary. The Survey of India shows the notional boundary of the forest. So, so we need to actually think about information, uh, what the regulator and the public sector should do. On the private sector side, I would think that, I mean, there are two, three things private sector can think about, but let me not prescribe anything because uh, Dr. Shiva Kumar and others who are doyans of private, private sector, they will know much better. But let me, from a quasi public uh, perspective, let me offer something. Uh, one is that we need to orient the trees outside forest idea away from plantation, pure plantation. Because plantation is only one part of the value. What we are, we are forgetting is the high value forest products. In our country, and Jayashi, you and I have talked about it earlier for wider public. Uh, wider audience who are here, we need to really, I think, I mean, it's my personal view, we need to get out this idea of NTFT, non-timber forest product. We mentioned, we talk about NTFT in a way that it is less valuable than timber. In fact, most of the NTFT is highly valuable and much more valuable for, than timber. So we need to start a discussion about high value forest product. And part of this is related to our Atmanirvar Bharat or import substitution requirement. For example, think about palm oil. We are talking about uh, palm oil plantation, et cetera, et cetera. What about the tree nuts in the country, which go, go all, the, all waste, whether you are from Rhododendron or from Mayagi or any other tree nuts? How valuable is that, that thing for well, well uh, purpose, purpose of oil supply? And that we think is important. Similarly, there are many, many other products we talk, can talk about. I'm from Northeast. In Delhi, I can only find the orchids from Myanmar because we don't really, we have actually probably destroyed all the orchids of Arunachal Pradesh, which can be done. So maybe when I do trees outside the forest, like they're doing it in Sikkim and Darjeeling now, we should actually do a orchid outside forest. I mean, so those kind of ideas. And for that, it is very important to, for the private sector to develop a micro and small enterprise model involving the communities. So, because nobody, nobody, not a company will be able to manage all of this. So we need to develop an ecosystem of micro and small enterprises who are actually looking at this as a business and viable business and sustainable business, and we should not should not try to exploit resources in a way that in Uttarakhand or in Meghalaya, which are rich in medicinal plants. And nowadays you go and find all medicinal plants are gone because, and we have, we have not given that kind of benefit to the local community or the state uh, state. So, so that's one. Community partnership, many, many ways you can think about, but enterprise model, I would think that it's a very, very important thing that it's not about cooperation, it's not about cooperative, it's not about preservation of life. It is about high income earning by doing better forestry, precision forestry, diversified forestry, outside forest. So that's our thing. We need to think about three or four other areas of services that forest produces and we need to think about whatever outside the forest we do, we might need to concentrate on those values. You are talking about carbon services or GHG services, which is very good and which should be done. In addition to that, we still think ecosystem services, let us try to do trees outside forest in a way that it produces ecosystem services. And 
one of the favorite example would be the butterfly requirements in the country. I mean, our butterflies are gone. So can we actually think about creating butterfly habitats in the country as part of trees outside forest or honeybees or anything else, uh, which will be required for the agriculture sector to sustain uh, food services, the food, for, food forest idea that in, started in India. And some of your colleagues are there, Rohini Ji and Jesh Ji will know them. So it's, it's a great idea that we need to, take, to talk about food service from the forest. Because if you think about the history of Indian forest, the old history that is, that forest used to provide for all the food. And how come we have adopted a model where forest doesn't provide any food? So this is important. We need to, need to uh, think about in those terms. And probably also private sector is a need to think about protect, protection and creation of high value high conservation value forest. Because within the public uh, forest area, uh, we have 5% of the forest area which is protected. It is not sufficient for the country of our need. This is, this is where sustaining the life is also important other than economy. So, so to sustain life outside the forest, we need to think about creating, can we create forests which are high conservation value? So I'll stop here. Uh, lots of uh, things I said, some of them may not be useful, some of them probably be useful. Uh, I've taken 10 minutes, 12 minutes. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tapas Ji. Uh, I think it, it's, it's a pretty interesting uh, uh, shift and, you know, we're really talking about more from a, how do we, <clears throat> uh, you know, look at uh, the, the forestry sector more holistically. And that's not just from a production perspective, but also conservation uh, perspective. I think you touched two, two of the points which are very, very dear to me personally, are the kind of work that we've been doing in the forestry sector. And I can share that, you know, in uh, the primary survey results that we have, uh, depending on the season, 30 to 40% of the uh, food consumption, calorie consumption actually comes from forest for the forest dependent community. And, uh, so it is, it is an absolutely critical part of, of, of that uh, ecosystem that we want to conserve and, and see what values that, that can be uh, uh, brought in. Also, on, on the enterprise model, I think back in 2012, and that's really worked for us in, in Orissa, again, based on our work, it has really uh, contributed not only from a perspective of uh, the uh, you know, returns or livelihoods of the people dependent on living in the forest fringe areas, but it also looks at uh, the sustainability of the resource per se. And, and we're very, very enthused with, with the results that, that we have so far. And, and I'm sure as we kind of go forward, we do need to really look at as part of these value chains, not only in the, uh, from the perspective of value of that particular uh, NTFP, but the range of NTFPs that are possible uh, and what kind of uh, information system, market systems that can potentially be triggered to to get get that value back into the forest and with with the primary primary collectors. I think uh, a very very uh, uh, opportune time to bring uh, Rohini in, uh, specifically when you know we've been kind of focusing more on uh, this this plus two on the the private private part of it. But on the collective side, you know, there's been a lot of initiatives over the last 25, 30 years where through CSR funding, through government funding, through you know, other uh, uh, grants, that uh, communities have been aggregated together, institutions have been formed. They've really looked at uh, village commons as, as a common you know, area where they have intervened, more from an agroecological balance perspective, uh, livelihood perspective. So, uh, over to you, Rohini, in terms of your opening remarks, and I'd appreciate if you could really uh, dwell a bit on, on these aspects as well. Thank you, Jayesh. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. And thank you uh, to the team for the invitation to be here. It's extremely difficult to follow up on three very eloquent speakers, Jayesh, you, yourself, Shivji, and Tapas. Um, so I've, I've sort of... Um, clustered my comments to, to three dimensions that I thought could add to the debate in the set of opening remarks. 
Um, one, of course, um, and this is, um, I'm coming to this from a position of research, but also a lot of the strategic consulting that I've been doing of late, thinking around the opportunities to make private finance land in um, on um, climate strategies to address, uh, sorry, forest and land strategies to address climate change, as well as um, sort of thinking about the political economy of getting these strategies underway. Uh, how do we how do we incentivize the behavioral change that is needed for um, the impact that we that we want? Now, one of the things that I do want to add, uh, sort of state up front, is that the science of um, you know land, forest and land based solutions to address the climate crisis have moved leaps and bounds, and there are. A set of fundamental things that um, have been globally accepted as absolutely essential. The first, of course, is that land-based solutions, whether forest or in croplands, cannot be exclusively for climate. They must also generate a whole host of ecosystem services. And when we think about croplands, food security is absolutely essential. When we think about forests, it's also biodiversity and so on. Not to say that um, you know, croplands don't generate these services. So one, of course, is that we need a climate plus approach. And the newer framings that we have around nature-based solutions, um, natural carbon capture, are all looking at a host of different solutions that can come together to generate multiple ecosystem services. The second sort of thing um, that is very key to the way in which science has moved um, is essentially the recognition of the centrality of tenu secure tenure and respected tenure, whether for indigenous peoples or local communities when it comes to maintaining land and forests. And so therefore we have uh, estimates coming out from um, our uh, the Rights and Resources Initiative and others, which are talking about the, the tons of carbon that are currently held in forests that are uh, safeguarded by indigenous communities and local com uh, indigenous peoples and local communities across the world. And what a shame it would be if any of this was released, um, um, you know, due to the need for conversion of forest lands into, um, um, you know, development projects. So two things, one of course is that we, our interventions must be cognizant of the range of services we need to provide. But secondly, also that we need to consider very, very um, deliberately the trade-offs that we make between environment and development when we think about these solutions. And the extent, you know, Tapasio spoke about high conservation value areas. You also touched upon um, the very, very strife issue of mining. But um, we, we must sort of think through some of these strategies. And in the context of private finance, they become very key because many of you would have seen the recent critiques that are coming out around the net zero commitments and how these are becoming ways for corporates to, um, to sort of feel good about what they're doing and to greenwash the actual impact that they're having, adverse impact that they're having on climate. So I think there's, there's tensions within, um, you know, within the sector that still remain. Of course, we've moved forward and we need to continue moving forward. The second sort of on the, on the more finance side of it is that, um, um, you know, not in this particular sort of panel, but oftentimes I've heard people conflate different types of private finance together. Now, CSR is sourced in the corporate sector, but is not necessarily an investment. Uh, there are uh, sort of mainstream investments, you know, you mentioned pension funds a little bit earlier, um, that can also, that are also being committed to the climate cause. Um, the question is, you know, how do we make a lot of this money land on the ground um, in countries like India? Of course, um, there are several studies that have been done of late that think about the barriers to getting private finance to land, whether it's in the forestry sector or otherwise. And one of the key, some of the key barriers, of course, are risks. Tabas, you spoke very eloquently about the perception of risks. Many of these risks are real. When you think about um, you know, uh, 
the tensions that are currently underway and one just needs to look at a, a website like the or a platform like the land conflict watch to see the incremental uh, numbers or increasing numbers of conflicts that are occurring across the country with respect to green initiatives and these include plantations these include afforestation and the attentions that are emerging, these are conflicts that are emerging between communities, bureaucracy, communities, and the private sector. And it's, it's of course, there are perceptions that need to be managed, but there are also life tensions. The good thing, though, is that we have solutions. We have a set of solutions available in policy to actually, that can actually be implemented to address many of these conflicts. Um, but sadly, like in many, many sectors, we are not exclusive. Unfortunately, um, many of these policies have not been implemented to their fullest extent or in the spirit of which um, to which they um, should have been. Now, when we think also of these uh, of the barriers that you know you have so many shining star examples, social enterprises, whether in commodity production, whether in timber, community-based enterprises that have come up, livelihoods models that have been generated over the past with communities as key. Um, but these don't get to scale. And there are considerable challenges uh, that need to be addressed. One, of course, is design. They were never designed to scale up. The design of these pilots did not include a scaling element or a scaling strategy. And so they remain confined as you know, these shining star, very localized, contextualized uh, pieces. How do we actually start scaling not only through replication, but also through learning and designing for different contexts? Um, this is something that is going to be extremely key when we think about how we make available capital land. The other thing is that you know, when I was at WRI, we did an estimate of the amount of money that was allocated to landscape restoration in the country. Uh, there were two or three things that were very interesting. We found that of the host of different projects that were conducted, most of them had community participation as key. And way back in the early 2000s, Arvind Khare, in a back of the envelope estimate, um, found that at least 20% of the costs of actually getting green efforts of the ground were borne by communities through voluntary contributions of labor. And therefore, you know, we, we know that this, whether in science or in practice, the role of communities has become quite essential. It cannot be ignored. The challenge arises in terms of um, uh, sort of ensuring that benefits reach them. And that is something that we need to look at. Of course, there is also, I would uh, very quickly say, because I'm very conscious of time, that we, you know, we, we don't get to scale. These, the initiatives we have are so small that they cannot really absorb the transactional costs of engaging with them are very high. So we don't have the deal makers and the brokers who can, who can ensure that money gets invested where it should. And finally, I will come to this uh, the point that, you know, you mentioned land tenure very early on, Jayesh. Land tenure is, I would say, a significant problem because it's the very basis of contract through which private finance needs to flow. And it can be individual contracts or it can be communities. So there is eventually, I mean, I, I want to say three things. One, of course, is that there, we need to think about finance and its disaggregated ways. We need to look at how it's suited for different elements of the strategies that we want to get off the ground. And also think about um, you know, the, the sort of vastness of um, how this finance can come to bear with different strategies to get to scale. And finally, I will end by saying that there is, when we think about private, the elephant in the room always is the absence of trust between private sector and communities. Um, there are very real fears on the ground of land crabs, of green crabs, of forests, of afforestation efforts being um, sort of leading to state takeover of lands, of restrictions coming in, of the FCA kicking in. These are real fears on the ground. And as we think about the 26 to 30 million, whether in a forest or a non-forest context, uh, we are going to have to contend with the elephant in the room. I'll pause here. Thanks, Roini. Uh, I think an absolutely critical aspect that you do really talk about uh, one is that we do need to, amongst the host of issues that all three of you have uh, touched upon, is also the perspective of uh, communication. 
uh, you know, trust building, uh, which is which is fragmentation is an absolutely critical element to that. And I think I'll I'll, I'll really turn on that specific issue to to Shivji again, and uh, really you know this a million acres that you do talk about as part of the uh, achievement uh, and the coverage that ICC has managed to do, you know, uh, on two two aspects: one on risk mitigation, and two on on the communication. How challenging it was, and um, you know, is there is there a uh, you know uh, a framework that that others can possibly uh, use? Over to you, Shivji. Yeah, in, in most of projects of this kind, which are uh, encompassing multiple stakeholders, given all the kind of aspects that have been uh, highlighted so far. It is the uh, building of social capital is the step one. It precedes uh, every other activity. And therefore, there is uh, 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 the whole dialogue process uh, through participatory appraisals uh, in terms of what the uh, local priorities are and uh, what are the ways in which uh, the, the protection can happen for the various rights and how the incomes can grow and all of that. I think it's a, it's a fairly substantial amount of time which is spent in the first instance to be able to build uh, that kind of trust. And the second aspect, like I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, was uh, induction of uh, money as uh, finance to support these uh, small growers to uh, get into planting. Uh, and uh, that the on successful plantations and recovery of money, money doesn't need to flow back, but goes back into a, a village development fund. Uh, that also played a significant role in terms of how it is done. And the fact that you have uh, made a significant investment on uh, using this uh, output as raw material, and uh, there is a reciprocal dependency that without that raw material, the factory will remain shut. And without that factory, the raw material, uh, the pro produce of these uh, growers is uh, uh, no uh, significant market value. Uh, I think that reciprocal dependency is another element which really uh, builds in trust. So from a communication perspective, these are the activities that really uh, help in uh, creating that uh, symbiotic relationship and pursuing. Uh, but the broader issues uh, that also have been highlighted, if I were to just touch upon, uh, from a, uh, both a policy perspective as well as in aligning multiple stakeholders uh, so that uh, these, these concerns are well addressed. In the first instance, obviously the clarity on what are the permitted models uh, are what are the models which are likely to get uh, approval. So in terms of what proportion of the land will be used for conservative forestry and what proportion for production forestry. Uh, so that clarity up front. And similarly, what is the participative planning by multiple stakeholders who are involved, uh, which uh, enables approval. So I think some of these, when they are well laid out uh, into the process that is defined, uh, certainly it helps in certain level of predictability in the approval process. Uh, otherwise, at the end of the effort, uh, or even uh, sometimes much after the approvals, uh, there's enough and more activism uh, to stop anywhere on tracks, and therefore uh, investment doesn't flow in. So therefore, the predictability of approval process and through the tenure period, if one were to say that you know, there is a 30-year tenure to make this a viable project, whether from the perspective of communities involved or from the perspective of uh, private sector bringing in the value chains or from any of the uh, investors, whether it's a pension funds or whoever, it's a predictability over this longer term period uh, that is important and therefore uh, that aspect. So I think these are the kind of things which go into building the multi-stakeholder trust and uh, make these things uh, a reality at scale. Absolutely critical, uh, uh, Shivji. I'd, I'd also, at this point, really, you know, uh, bring back uh, uh, one of the kind of 
uh, taking and building on what uh, you know Tapa said, that one is just not in enough to really look at purely from a carbon perspective. You know that that's that's always uh, to my mind an incremental uh, benefit that we could really look at. It has to be core at the at the you know prices that the wood would fetch. But you you did mention uh, you know at, at a good time uh, when the prices were high that you were able to monetize uh, some of the credits. Uh, could you elaborate just uh, on uh, how how that process went about and uh, what what benefits that did the community and the individual farmer actually uh, could monetize on? Yeah, once you have the framework of the baseline clear in terms mm -hmm. of what is the uh, uh, current uh, baseline with respect to carbon and what the whole uh, agronomy practice and over time, how much is the sequestration that can be allowed uh, through approved uh, audited processes. Then there is a uh, the, the uh, Sangha that I mentioned, the cooperative society of the uh, growers which are coming together. Then the uh, systematic audit is done. Uh, so that the entire incremental carbon credit that accrues uh, flowed back to the uh, farmers uh, in uh, doing, uh, doing this. And at that point of time, as part of the uh, net income uh, that the farmer was uh, getting, nearly 7% of the uh, total uh, net income came in from the carbon credits. Okay. Uh, for the, for the uh, growers. Still, that still a very large proportion came from wood, uh, wood directly. No, that's that's uh, that's that's helpful to know, and I, I think uh, uh, moving to to Tapas, uh, really, you did talk about this, uh, you know, very very interesting aspect in terms of the ecosystem services being also part of the core, uh, you know, interest for for the private sector, and I, I just wanted to really, uh, you know, pick your brains on, on uh, uh, this uh, term private sector. Who, who all are you, uh, you know, classifying as private sector? It is not necessarily the wood-based industry or ITC or the other similar industries. Uh, do you do you have a much broader definition for the private sector? Tapas, you here? You are not unmuted, Tapas. <clears throat> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um... Yeah, it's a tough question, uh, Jayashi. You have this great ability to ask very tough questions in a simple manner. So, <laughs> no, it's uh, not very clear. I'll try to, I mean, I'm trying to define. I mean, it's not very clear what, is, what should be the definition. I'll say that uh, non-government agencies who are either enterprise or investors, uh, they are my private, primary targets here. Yeah when I say, when I address anything to as private sector. Uh, so, so the examples could be many. And uh, so uh, one of the best example of ecosystem services uh, is the uh, city of New York, uh, which pays the upstream city for the quality of water they receive. So if the water is polluted, they don't pay the upstream city, but the, if the water is clean and there is an agreement between two utilities in New York and the up, upstream utilities. So if those guys keep the water clean, the cost of uh, cleanup or cost of uh, uh, assurance of water quality for New York goes down and therefore they pay. And payment of uh, ecosystem services has been tried in many, many ways in many, many countries in Chile and Peru and East Asia. Uh, which is uh, again looking at investors and uh, enterprise uh, wherever there is a hydropower uh, plant if you can actually ensure that water flows to that hydropower plant then you get money by managing your catchment better which will mean that you need to think about your uh, uh, forest management better or landscape management better now so not everything is applicable here but i would think that i mean if you take the case of the uh, Jaljivan mission, the spring sheds in the country, which is, uh, which there is a program uh, fortunately now to uh, conserve the spring sheds in the country, rejuvenate the spring sheds in the country and 
if I am doing a forest, I mean both sides on the public forest where the government is responsible and the forest outside, uh, tree cover outside forest where the private sector is there, I should get some benefit if I am helping rejuvenation or conservation of the spring shed because that's the lifeline. And across the board, we can actually think about how how to how do we do this modeling that by doing sustainable management forest in the area that I control outside the forest. How do I contribute to the national program on spring shed rejuvenation, Jal Jivan, etc., and whether I can get some payment for ecosystem benefit. I mean, not, not the large ones, but the small, small detailed ones. Um, so this is something to be uh, inter uh, this of interest. Similar, uh, there are many, many lakes. All the lakes in Punjab are in the center of the city. All the, all the uh, wildlife sanctuaries in, in Punjab is in the center of these uh, different towns. So what do I do? Can I can I can can I do my for trees outside forest in a way that I can actually rejuvenate these uh, water bodies? So these are kind of things that you can actually think about, and uh, and as long as there are utilities, what using the water? For example, if I, some utility water supply utility is using the lake water to pump out water and provide water supply, they should be interested in paying me off because I am ensuring their availability of water. So in that way, uh, I mean, there can be many, many oh, examples. That's, that's really... These ecosystem services are important. Thank you. Yes. Yes. I think uh, we come back uh, again, you know, some of the research and uh, yeah, based on our work that while, uh, you know, it, it really sounds uh, exciting that the communities uh, be uh, incentivized by the, the services that they extend because of protection of the forest. You know, you give a very old and classical example for the city of New York. Uh, we did some work in, in Himachal. There's been a lot of studies that have been done in hilly areas. And I think we really come down to two primary uh, uh, basic requirements. One is in terms of the, the tenure uh, and, and rights that the community has on, on that particular uh, area. And of course, the second very, very basic but absolutely critical element is, is on demarcation and you know forest boundary demarcation uh, that, that needs to exist. A lot of conflicts, forest to non-forest, uh, with the department and with the uh, is, is primarily, again, in terms of lack of that clear visual uh, demarcation um, of the forest itself uh, with, with the rest of non-forest areas. You know, we, we have very uh, different states do follow this. We have village forests, we have, uh, you know, reserve revenue, uh, different different uh, dimensions of the, the forest that, that, that there are. And, you know, as part of this whole payment for ecosystem services, uh, we do need to really delineate these these boundaries uh, very very uh, critically, uh, and as well on the tenure and rights uh, that needs to be recognised for the communities uh, as a whole on areas that they are protecting and should be incentivised for. Uh, one one of the aspects, you know, uh, hearing the three of you, and I'd, I'd first go to Tapis and then to to Roini, uh, you know, we. What, what I could sense from this whole uh, uh, discussion that we do really need from the private sector, uh, where I would define this as outside of the what governments are bringing in as part of their contribution to, to, to forests. Uh, you know, what this, we do need to really build on uh, an entire ecosystem to attract, you know, this additional capital that is needed. So that is my question to you is, uh, what are the initiatives that the bank is taking uh, in supporting uh, India as a country with, through the government or outside to build this ecosystem uh, uh, for, for, for these investments to come in, if at all? Maybe Rohini should go first, but... Okay, so so question I, to Rohini. I'll, uh, I'll try, yeah. No, sorry, okay, I'll okay, try. sure. 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 We'll, we'll wait, wait for your uh, thoughts. So, yeah, <laughs> so see, see, uh, uh, we realize uh, 
there is no revolutionary idea that world bank is thinking now this has been part of the process for so many years and it's not that none of these ideas are to be new to india uh, whatever world bank can bring from outside this has been this has been known uh, somehow in our country things happen very incrementally good news is that it happens uh, so it requires a bit of patience probably uh, we are interested to work with the government of india and the state government there are several things which are uh, which are legacy uh, legacy regulations and legacy ways of looking at plans and programs uh, for example the thing that we talked about earlier i talked about earlier is this a uh, normative planning someone some years ago decided that per hectare cost of plantation is 35000 rupees now whether you are working in a rain shadow whether you are working in wind and morena or whether you are working in mosindram it's 35000 so this normative planning so slowly this normative planning has to go i'm talking more about the government's own public forest uh, from normative planning you get into special planning things which are good for appropriate for the location and geography uh, where these are planned so that's important irrespective of the regulation so this is nothing to do with regulation it's some some way of working which is normative planning similarly even when we talk about community managed forestry or social forestry uh, in many ways we have to call we have we have created a set of norms that people can be paid in uh, community forestry in many many places people are treated as like i mean participation is basically a uh, participation is labor now this norm has been created it is not intended to be it is supposed to be social forestry it's supposed to be community forestry and they are supposed to make decision but we have created a norm the signatory is always the ranger forest ranger is the range officer it is nothing to do with regulation but it's a norm and therefore we are excluding people from participating in forest we need to think about wherever appropriate to change these norms and part of this is being done in our uh, projects where we are doing. Uh, facilitating community led forestry so where communities make all the decision communities spend community spend the money communities account for it there is no need for government to get involved in uh, some of these things you can actually <coughs> like in other cases you can actually think about results based uh, expenditure uh, in the budget many of the central government government budgets are now results based you are actually looking at results so results in forestry not about expenditure and who makes the expenditure so this power relations should be changed so that is what we are working through our projects in many many places as far as possible we are trying to create uh, this is for these reforms and some of these are related to also sometimes wrong sometimes ignorant sometimes you have forgotten decision forestry we have forgotten in this country we had a good system of forestry in this country is scientific forestry that's more or less absent now because you have forgotten you have not practiced for so many years so my colleagues who are present here pius and others should be able to give you more examples during discussion but these are things we are talking about in terms of regulatory reform i think uh, the so civil society the industry are talking about it the government is talking about it world bank has no additional idea to, to talk about but i think uh, uh, in addition to those things the reform and planning and implementation process and improving the capacity of the government to to do what the government should do is it is important i mean we have this idea that contractors are not permitted in forest areas god knows why if i am able to monitor them if i am able to control the contractors why cannot i i can get contractors to plantation which i am doing as a government so we need to have sufficient uh, capacity built in the uh, governments irrespective of the skill and knowledge of the government which is uh, which is there I mean, there's no denying that they understand forestry they have skills but probably they do not have enough number of people to implement things the way the government should do so those so 
once the public side of the forest management improves, I think there will be much more openness about managing trees outside forest through private sector because you are again looking at those from the perspective of results and not necessarily who is spending how much money and why. Because right now the preoccupation is about expenditure. So thank you. Thanks. Rohini, over to you, please. <laughs> yeah, Rohini, I think in, uh, let me just uh, come in and you know, more, more from a perspective that we, as we do look at uh, the landscape restoration, it is just not the, uh, with the forest, it is, you know, multiple entities that, that, that come about. You did refer to your, your work at WRI uh, on, uh, you know, research on uh, landscape restoration. Uh, what is it that we do really look at this conflicting objectives of different departments and, you know, how do you really uh, address that. And I, I, I'm asking this more from a perspective that for any entity which is private, and I mean any, any entity outside of the government, I'm classifying as private. How do they deal with this multi-faceted uh, being uh, called the government, uh, but represented through different departments? Have, has there been any any initiative where you think uh, it has worked and can be scaled up? So Jayush, what you're what you're very subtly referring to is the myths of convergence. <laughs> and someone once said to me that you know I could I could talk about convergence till I was blue in the face, but I would never see it, and maybe even my great grandchildren wouldn't see it. Um, convergence is not easy. I mean, think about it. We as independent organizations would we ever be willing to pool? Um, you know, it takes a lot of effort for us to pool our monies together into a single project. Aligned funding, even in the private sector, is not an easy thing to accomplish. Um, there are structural, functional um, barriers in place within the ways in which governments work that makes it quite difficult to, to think about investing in convergence-oriented projects. Nevertheless, these have succeeded where, you know, and the World Bank um, watershed project, some of them especially the one that was um, awarded in Karnataka sometime, uh, some year, many, many years ago, was oh, something right. that did very well. They created a separate mission for it. I think from the point of view of private sector and the ways in which you describe it um, so broadly, one thing to recognize is that different private sector sources of financing come with different strengths and weaknesses. So here you have a wide spectrum of uh, sources of financing that need to map into an equally wide spectrum of interventions, whether it's agroforestry, whether it's natural farming with agroforestry, whether it's only forestry, only plantations, and you know the range just goes on. So you've got that at one level. You've got very diverse stakeholders, not only in terms of governments and their departments, but also communities. Typically, whether it's been watershed projects or any other projects, we've found it easier to make com communities as the um, sort of locus for investment. Um, and that's how a lot of our projects in the, public, in the public sector or in the private sector have taken off. Of course, there have been you know, individual entities, but when we think about communities, it's been some level of decentralized institution. Now, when we think about private sector financing, we are also thinking about community tenure. These communities need to have tenure that is legally recognized and administratively respected. These are two very different things. Um, but we need to have those in place. And so therefore, to bring, you know, to answer your question, it's if the locus of intervention is communities and for all different projects, we, you know, whether it's MGNREGA, whether it is any other different um, sort of wasteland development project or agriculture project or agroforestry project, at some level, our common ground is, is at that ground level, is at the grassroots level. And we need that institution to be built out there. I would say one thing, I think civil society organizations, we are in a great place today, all of us. We have commitment from a range of private sector institutions who want to invest in, in forest and land-based solutions for climate. 
the challenge i think on our part as civil society organizations is we are in the same space as the tech organizations where we haven't recalibrated our skills to be good brokers for matchmaking what is needed and where the finance is available and this is something that has compounded us for over 20 years now you think about all those you know private sector conservation uh, ambitions that we were never able to uh, fulfill about 15 20 years ago think about the climate um, story now yeah. that except for the renewable sector we are not able to match make effectively and i think this is where civil society organizations really need to work with communities to figure out those business models that can absorb finance to scale um, absorb in, uh, investments at scale and also demonstrate the range and the scale of impact that they can generate. We have not, we haven't really done either of those well enough to inspire the confidence. And I think here's a real lift for many, many NGOs working in this space. Oh, very well articulated, uh, Troini, absolutely. As, as a third sector that we do talk about the civil society, I think there is there is a lot more that uh, can be done, should be done, and, and there are capacities and capabilities that are available. But I, I do sense, just, just as a remark to that, that over the last uh, few years, particularly last four or five years, that we've seen the nature of support that is coming to the civil society. I think the level of accountability and disclosures uh, and, and, uh, is, is, is improving. And that should really bring in a lot more thinking in terms of uh, how best to leverage and be, you know, not not in any negative way, be that catalyst, be that broker to 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 uh, you know bridge this gap between the, the funds and you know where it needs to be invested. So so uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Shivji. Uh, one last question to you, and before we you know kind of open up for uh, I'm picking it up from the, the list of questions. You know, just and I'm, I'm sure this question uh, Animesh has asked is not really related to IPC per se, but you as representative here of the private sector is to really, what is the value that private sector sees in, in the forestry sector uh, from your uh, personal perspective, whether it's plantation forest, plantations, forest, NBFPs or any other. Sure, I think that's what I had really started with in terms Thank of uh, how do you integrate these value chains into uh, the businesses. Uh, I, I talked about the, the headroom that was available in the wood sector, mm -hmm. that uh, in the first instance, the low hanging fruit really is the $7 billion worth of imports uh, that uh, one can substitute with uh, domestic production. It will take about 15 years or so. Uh, to really get to that kind of a scale. It's not going to happen, uh, obviously, in a hurry. Uh, but the significant uh, uh, collateral outcome is going to be the, the carbon sequestration for something like this. And uh, business, as usual, would get this 7 to about 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, it's essentially that kind of value is what is there uh, in wood. And uh, my own estimate of... Uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, NTFP, uh, as well as other plantations like orchards that I was talking about, uh, would be uh, at least another two to three billion dollars each in the medium run uh, as an incremental value. So it's a very substantial kind of opportunity uh, to draw in. I think once we create the viable projects with the predictable policy, uh, then I think it is both a business opportunity uh, that will uh, create. Uh, livelihoods as well as the environmental benefits. Benefits. Thank you, sir. On on, on that note, uh, you know we have about five minutes to go. Uh, may I request each one of you top three uh, recommendations or suggestions uh, that uh, we should take take home uh, with us on really promoting uh, private sector investments into the forestry sector. Uh, we start with you, Tapas. I think that we need to change the narrative a little. Uh, the, the dominating narrative in the country today uh, is about 
private versus community uh, even all the commentary about the uh, paper which is in circulation for public comments which is from the government about uh, in improving in their in their mind improving the forest conservation act uh, and then you see a lot of debate about uh, private versus community i mean if private sector takes over what happens to community community etc cetera, etc cetera. now i think it is our duty all of us together to see that i mean uh, we have to talk about these examples where community has developed and community development has many, many ways. It is not about how much income you have for, on forestry, how much dependence you have on forestry. What you derive from forestry, what pleasure, what livelihood, what enjoyment, all of these things. I mean, it's not only money. What you derive from forestry and what is the model which is going to help you. And that is important that we need to, uh, need to start a dialogue about uh, how the best possible solution could be there, where private sector and community work in mutual interest, uh, mutually beneficial interest. Now, I know that, I mean, again, it's a cliche. We have talked about it for a long time, but we have not communicated enough on that. So that's number one, I think. Number two, I think we need to think about the model of plantation or model of forestry. And uh, maybe all of the things that I'm talking about carbon services, food services, ecosystem services, conservation services, or life services. So maybe at the private sector level, we actually, um, all the private sector players get together, we pledge, uh, like in the government, we say, what is the government policy? Like all the people in the private, se uh, private sector who are in the forest domain, uh, they should come and say that this is our policy, this is our pledge. We are looking for creating forest. And we are citizens of this country. We are as responsible as the government are. Uh, so this will be our contribution to the to the country, not only from economic and uh, revenue sense, but for sustaining life, sustaining sustaining uh, happiness in this country. So, uh, so I would think that this change of narrative is very very important and. Uh, uh, unless someone takes lead, it is not going to change. And maybe private sector, maybe in uh, civil society, we some of us uh, need to take that lead to change the narr narrative. So that, I mean, space for doing things open up. Otherwise, it is, uh, right now, the space is dominated by polemic. And I don't think uh, this will allow us to go to real success levels unless we and down these noise and really think about alternative and future. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Tapish. Over to you, Roimi. Thank you, Jayesh. Um, very quickly, I think I'd like to pick up, uh, you know, sort of pick up on what Tapas was saying. I think the uh, binary between, uh, the binary of private versus community is unhealthy especially if we describe the private sector as broadly as we tend to do. Um, I think the challenge lies predominantly with the corporate sector and the lack of trust that I spoke about earlier. I do feel that um, even as we change the narrative, there is ample scope for corporate sector involvement when we think about both the strengths of the corporate sector as well as the vast a range of things that need to be done to get the rest, to get restoration of the ground. So think about investments in nurseries, think about investments in MRV technologies. How do we make low cost, uh, MRV low cost um, and participatory? Think about something that the corporate sector does beautifully across all commodities, which is creating demand and sometimes creating artificial demand. If we have 26 to 30 million hectares of land under forest and tree cover additionally, we are going to need to harvest that forest. We are going to need to use it sustainably. The ministry launched the Wood is Good campaign some years ago. It, it had a bit of energy to begin with, didn't do phenomenally well and then tapered off, but that is something that the West has picked up on. They're looking at mass timber, they're looking at structure, you know, using timber and structures. 
we the corporate sector has a tremendous role to play in both generating demand and ensuring inputs. Um, and these are real investable opportunities that can absorb finance and that can really benefit from corporate sector strengths. So I think we need to not only change the narrative, but also explore those opportunities that are not about getting the land, digging a pit and planting a tree, because that is where the tensions arise. There's so much more that can be done. And maybe we won't need to be creative given the urgency we have before us. I'll pause here. Thanks, thanks, Roini. So the first word uh, of Shiv and last word of Shivji. Uh, over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. So I think to uh, make both of these wishes really come true in the sense of collaboration and convergence, uh, I, I just want to uh, give an example of an interesting work being done by the government of Andhra Pradesh as part of public-private producer partnership in integrated agriculture development, uh, where uh, they identified value chains that the state has competitive advantage in, invited uh, anchors from private sector, cooperative sector, not for profit, whoever it could be, any non-government, and say that uh, now you commit to uh, certain public good outcomes in terms of raise in farmers' income and uh, environmental contribution with respect to water saving and things of that kind, aligned with your own business and uh, make a proposal for the project in terms of what you would commit as investment, demand uh, uh, aspects brought in, and uh, uh, the productivity enhancement that needs to be done. And then government acts like a venture capitalist. And the venture capital really being available is all the schemes that are available with the government. And uh, uh, no need for any additional scheme. But in order to execute this project in the course of next five years, tell us what all government schemes need to get converged in this value chain cluster. And uh, we'll make that available. Mm -hmm. I think that is what uh, is now put in place. And uh, one such project uh, we are executing for uh, 100,000 acres of uh, chili farming, getting into integrated pest managed uh, uh, chilies for export. And uh, that convergence indeed has happened uh, with commitment of uh, support for uh, farmers, uh, shared infrastructure and capacity building uh, for the larger community of farmers and so on, coming in from those uh, uh, government schemes coming in as venture capital. And uh, on our part, we brought in whatever investments required for uh, extension work and the factory capacities and so on uh, for uh, ultimately achieving the public good outcomes uh, like uh, farmer increase, doubling income and uh, water saving and those kind of uh, environmental benefits and uh, multiplying uh, our own business opportunity in expanding exports. So there, there needs to be a framework for enabling this convergence and uh, collaboration, which is very much also required in the forestry field. Mm -hmm. And I think that's possible. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to all, all three of you, uh, Shivji, Satish, Roini. Uh, I think uh, uh, topic of this nature, given the differences and we talked about, you know, about the uh, not-for-profit versus for-profit uh, endless debates that we have had. We do need to really come together. But in terms of, uh, I think in terms of building this ecosystem and, and what uh, really if, if I can say uh, on, on behalf of Angelica, that, you know, we, we do look at and do need to create ecosystem uh, around this uh, as, a, as, a, as a group. As, as a company, we've, we've been able to really showcase this, uh, uh, you know, uh, at a scale, what kind of services that need to bring in uh, to, to create an ecosystem around a particular sector. I think in terms of the, the discussions today, uh, we, we can collectively really strive to, to bring that together. And uh, you know we would we would uh, really like to reach out to you at an opportune time and a convenient time to you to really see what is it that we can uh, collectively do together. Uh, you know, culling out from uh, such uh, rich and free sharing of uh, ideas today, 
And uh, at that point, I uh, think we are, I've been just told we're running six minutes uh, later than uh, what was scheduled. Uh, thank you again to all three of you. Uh, uh, very, very humble that you, you accepted our invitation. And thanks to all the participants uh, here uh, for your patience, uh, questions that have come in, uh, and we'll be in touch. Thank you so much.